Good morning. Thanks very much, Jim, for that introduction. Um, it is really, really good to be here. And I mean, it's really, really good to be here. Um, as I look at the devastation that has happened across the globe uh, with regard to uh, the pandemic over the last two, two and a half years, um, from a work perspective, I think this community, open source community, uh, has really been affected the least from a work perspective than any uh, organization. In the sense that, you know, yeah, lots of knowledge workers were able to work from home, um, but they had to make that transition. They had to figure out how to do that, how to communicate, what processes they need to put in place, what tools they needed. So it was different. But for us, one day to the next was actually the same. We were used to working from home. We're used to working um, from disparate parts of the, of, the, of the globe, but we come together every now and then to resync. And so events, conferences are actually very, very important. Um, and I, it's, as I've, I've been doing this for uh, about 22 years now, working in open source, and I'm always building bridges between companies and the developers that are part of the community um, with those companies or with other companies. And one of the things that I've noticed is it's really difficult to explain to management that hasn't been involved in open source um, how important these conferences are. But then just recently, I've been seeing all of these articles and various leaders of various companies talking about um, how important it is to come back to the office. And so I took one just recently from a technology leader and I replaced the word office with the word open source event and I replaced the word um, company with community and project. And this is what I ended up with. Open source events are a place where we meet other people, create social contacts, establish new friendships, and for some, we may find the love of our life. Well, maybe that doesn't happen that much here, but I do know of cases. These things are unlikely to happen in a two-dimensional team call. Maybe even more importantly, the conferences provide for a way to integrate new talent into the project. It is very difficult for people new to the community to establish a new network without meeting physically. Conferences facilitate the transfer of skill between people. It is a way to develop as a professional and a way for inexperienced colleagues to learn from more experienced. I also believe that we need to meet in person to ensure that we have a uniform and strong culture in our community. That was just swapping out those two words, but I think that's an extremely good description of why coming to events is important. And I expect for many of us, as we ramp back up, getting permission to come to conferences may be difficult. Managers often think of conferences as the boondoggle where an employee sloughs off for a week and drinks a lot of beer. And while maybe there might be beer involved, um, there's a lot of good things that happen. And that's the type of interworking that we do when we come to conferences. So use this type of, you know, find out what your leaders are saying about coming back to the office and actually use those arguments for why it is you come here. <clears throat> The other thing I want to talk about briefly is just where we are from a perception standpoint and a pervasiveness standpoint with open source. 1991, Linus initiates the Linux project, and they had about 10 years where everybody left them alone, and they actually formed their own culture. Uh, they built the processes that, for me, I know today as open source best practices. Um, I started in 2001 when HP really got involved in Linux, and that's when the rest of the big tech folk got involved as well. And I learned what it meant to be an open source project by what I saw in the Linux community. And I still, to this day, consider that the gold standard and the way open source projects should be run. So when I engage in another open source project, it's that model that I look at. <clears throat> Between 2001 and 2012, there was a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt about open source. Uh, we had the scotch uh, lawsuits against Linux, Everything was really unsure, um, and a lot of uh, organizations didn't know they were using open source. Uh, at, when I was at HP, I was working uh, with a consulting group, and we would, go to, um, we would go to the financial services organizations, and we'd go to their C-suite, and we'd be talking to the CIO, uh, and, as well as a bunch of their, uh, their lieutenants and such, and we'd say, so how are you managing open source coming into your organization? And invariably, their answer would be, well, we don't have to worry about that because we don't have any open source coming in. And also, invariably, there would be some junior manager who shyly raised his hand and said, well, actually, yeah, we got that DNS server, um, as well as, you know, the email server, and I got that LAMP stack running. 
And so they realized that they now had open source in their environment and they had to do something about it. They needed to manage it. So the to-do group, open source program offices started to take off and that's how that occurred. A lot of that fear, uncertainty, and doubt went away around that time. And in the teens, we've had an explosion of open source, right? So we went from tens of thousands of projects to tens of millions of projects. And that's what's happened over that decade, um, coming up into 21 and 22. All good stuff. Again, you can't really start a platform. You can't really start an application without picking your open source components. But it's also the case that now in 2022, the world has woken up to um, open source and its ubiquity. Back in that 2012 period, it was organizations realizing they had open source components running in their data center. Now everybody has just woken up to the fact that any commercial application you buy has a lot of open source in it. And so it now matters to a lot more people. Um, and I just want us as a community, as we're looking at what we're doing, as we're saying we need to be more secure, we need to be more secure. That's true, we've always got room to improve. But the point being is that we're actually in a new era in the sense that everybody now recognizes the ubiquity and the value and the importance of open source. Um, and I'm, in, I'm surprised that I can make this statement to pretty much any technology leader now and I get zero pushback. Modern software development is based on open source. So just to say that it's 80% open source or whatever, that doesn't quite do it. I mean, when you start to build an application, you pick your technology components. What's my storage gonna be? What's my message bus gonna be? What's my, what's my fundamental platform? Be it containers, be it AI, whatever. You pick those components and then you build your logic to actually fit those pieces together. So we start with open source. And recognizing that as a company and as anybody who's using software, which as we know is pretty much everybody at this point, that's an important statement to make. I know that Ericsson understands it. That's why we actually are platinum members of the Linux Foundation, uh, the uh, Open Infrastructure Foundation, as well as the um, uh, Open uh, Software Security Foundation. Um, we're here primarily today because we're continuing to expand. So we're hiring uh, embedded Linux developers, Yocto developers, uh, CICD engineers, Kubernetes, particularly in the networking space. Uh, if any of those sound interesting and Ericsson sounds like an interesting place to work, come talk to us at the booth. And with that, thank you for your time.